Hey everybody, today we're going to be creating this stylized wood material. I got a lot of questions about it when I shared some images from my short film recently, and I did these textures in Substance Painter, but I'm going to show you how to create something similar in Blender. You don't need a tablet to follow along with this tutorial because I'm providing the textures in the description below. However, I'll walk you through how I painted the textures, and I'll be using the Artisol D16 Pro, which Artisol sent me this for free to use in my videos, and I have to say I'm pretty impressed with it so far. It's an affordable tablet brand, and and they actually have a sale going on right now. Now I'm not a review channel, but I will share some of my thoughts on my experience with the tablet at the end of the video if you're curious. But with that, let's get started. So you can download the wood texture in the description below and skip ahead, but I wanted to walk you through some painting tips if you'd like to paint your own textures. First of all, it's important to get a palette together, and I like to work with four colors for these kind of things, going from darkest to lightest. I created a 1024 by 1024 texture with my middle base color. After that, I began smearing large brush strokes back and forth, and this is where pressure sensitivity of a tablet really does come in handy. I like the smear tool a lot, and I use that to hide some of my brush strokes sometimes. Next, you work on the fine details. I use the darkest colors to build out the edges of the boards and the cracks, and from there I begin adding highlights to the edges of the darkest cracks. Lastly, I went back through, adding some additional random lines and specks with random colors from the palette. Always keeping in mind that edge highlights will land on cracks and going from darkest to lightest, kind of leading up there to kind of get a more gradual fade. The blur brush comes in handy for softening up some of those smaller brush strokes as well. So here you see that I have a plane here and I've added a basic material to it called wood and that just gives us this principal BSDF node to start with and this is where we're going to be starting. Now if you've downloaded the texture I've made or have made your own, you're going to want to put a texture node here. And you can also just grab that texture that you saved out from off screen and drag that in there from your explorer. So let's go ahead and let's plug this color node into the base color here and because I have it on material, I can see it. Now I'm actually going to work in rendered view. Now some of the effects I'm doing are only going to work in cycles. And what we're going to do is just add an area light and rotate that a bit. So I'm just gonna rotate that by 90 degrees, kind of go into the top view there, scale that out, and then I'm just gonna give that a higher number. And really, we're just doing that so that we can kind of get an idea of our roughness map and displacement map as those things kind of go on. So I always recommend that you enable Node Wrangler because I'm going to be using some of these shortcuts. Now Node Wrangler comes with Blender, so no need to buy or download anything for that. So we're going to grab this image texture node and we're going to hit Control T and that's going to give us a texture coordinate and mapping node. And by default, it'll put it to your UV. You can change that if you need. Now what I like to do is I like to go ahead and add a value node. And then I plug this into the scale, which will affect the mapping and you can see here with the default value 0.5 it gets bigger and then I can bump that up to something like 3 and then I'm able to see kind of more of the wood there and I have it set to flat and repeat here which allows it to kind of tile like that. So first what we're going to do is we're going to add a color ramp node and we're actually going to be using a couple of these so let's just go ahead grab this and duplicate that once and then duplicate that one more time and we're just going to drag these down here and save those for later. So moving on, we will grab this color ramp and first let's do our roughness. So we'll take this color and we're going to feed it into the factor there. And then what we can do is we can actually put this in the color here and that'll give us an idea of what our roughness map looks like to give us more control. We'll take that and we'll put that into the roughness. And you can see here that with the default value, we have a lot of reflections there as we can see that there. So we're actually just gonna kind of rotate there so we can see that light and use that to kind of guide us in our reflections. Now you can do whatever settings you want here and make the wood as reflective or unreflective as you want. I'm going to kind of show you what I settled on. So what I decided to do was actually invert this white node here and the black node. And let's go ahead, set that there. And then now I'm going to drag this down to maybe around here. And the thing is, I really only want these pieces to kind of be reflective. I don't want the crevices to be reflective because over time that kind of varnish wears off. So that's what we're trying to simulate. So I'm just kind of go there. And now if we unplug this from the base color and we plug this back in, we can see that we're getting some reflectiveness, but not too much. And you can play with that until you get it to a point that you like. But I found for myself that I liked it around here that I got a little bit of reflectiveness but not too much. 
Now let's go ahead and we're going to work on the bump node next. So the bump node is going to add kind of like surface imperfections and give it the illusion of a little bit of depth without actually changing the geometry. So what we'll do is we will grab the image node up here. We will again plug that into the factor. And so we can see what we're doing. We'll grab this into the base color and then we will take this and we need to plug it into the normal, but we need an extra node for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to search for a bump node. We're gonna put a bump node here. We're gonna feed that into the normal. We're gonna feed our color into the height information. And you can see already that it's kind of creating more of a texture there. And then we can go ahead and adjust that accordingly. Again, you can play with this and get it as bumpy as you want. But what I liked was if I pulled up the black just a little bit to kind of contrast this right here, and then I pulled my white down to kind of make that contrast a bit more extreme. And again, if we plug our color node in there, you can kind of see how those are starting to play together now and to give us a little bit more of kind of a finished stylized texture. So now the last piece and arguably the biggest piece is the height map. So what we're going to do is we're going to again feed this image node into this factor down here. And then we need to add a displacement node. So let's go ahead to search displacement. We find that right there. And what we're going to do is we're going to feed this up here into the displacement. And then we'll grab this color and we will want to put that into the height here. And you can leave the mid level and object space at default. And we can play with the scale. And by default, you can see that it's not actually affecting the geometry at all. And that's because if we tab in here, there's no geometry effect and we also have to add an additional setting. So let's come over here to the materials. We're gonna twirl up our surface node there and we can come down here to the settings and you see here that our displacement is set to bump only. And you can set that to displacement or displacement and bump. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna do displacement and bump. And you see now that our scale is affecting it as it's kind of jutted the whole thing back, but there's no geometry to work with. But what we're going to do first is we're gonna come up here to our render properties, and you're going to wanna to go to feature set and experimental. Now, if this doesn't work for you, you can just go ahead and you can right click that plane and subdivide and add a bunch of geometry and do it that way. But I prefer to do it this way because it's a bit more modular. So now we're gonna come down and we're gonna add a subdivision surface modifier. And if you've added that, after turning on experimental, you'll see that we now have this adaptive information here. So if we click adaptive, we then get the option a dicing scale. And the smaller the number this is, the more it's gonna kind of divide it up and give you more micro details. Now, because we're dealing with a stylized texture, not a realistic texture, some of those micro details can cause us issues. We can already see here that as we're looking, because it's looking at the highlights to kind of pick its high points that since we've brushed in some of those highlights, we're getting all these kind of jagged points out. So we don't want that much detail, we just want a little bit. So you can kind of play around with this again and find what you'd consider to be a sweet spot. But I found that a dicing scale of two kind of gave me a nice middle ground between detail and not giving us so much detail that it was gonna kind of show off every brush stroke in a way we didn't want. Of course, now that we've added a subdivision surface modifier on our plane, you see that it has turned it into a circle as it's kind of moved around there. So to fix that, what we're going to do in this plane, we'll grab those four edges and edit mode, and then we'll hit shift E and drag that out until the line turns purple. And what that does is gonna kind of create a crease there for subdivision surface to know that that's going to stay sharp. So once you've creased those edges, let's move on and go to adjusting our displacement here. Clearly the scale's a little high right now and we're not gonna need that much displacement. Let's get in here and kind of play. So first of all, we have this ramp slider here where we can kind of change what is and isn't displaced. And again, we can feed that into our base color. And for now, let's go ahead and turn that scale down to zero. And we can see here that we have a grayscale image of our kind of displacement map there. And then we can go ahead and play with these. So I actually want to kind of nullify doing the highlights because with the way the boards work is we would see a lot of displacement here where these cracks would be deeper, but in the highlights, they're not really gonna pop off. Once it's up here, the boards are kind of pretty even. So what we can do is we can drag this forward a little bit. And what that's going to do is kind of create a darker color there and give us a more 
kind of extreme look there. And then we can bring this forward if you want, and that can kind of neutralize some of those mid highlights or make them more extreme depending on how you want to do. You can also come here, you can grab the white and you can kind of pull that white down to kind of diffuse that just ever so slightly. And then what we can do is turn our scale back up. And we can see already with our scale that it is only kind of pushing in those as well. And if you want, you can play with the mid level here. So let's say we turn the mid level to zero and that'll keep us kind of even with our plane there. And then what we can do is kind of play with how much we want. So we probably don't want a one scale because wood is not this extreme. So let's go to about 0.25 and I'd say that's feeling pretty good. Let's jump and put our base color back in here to kind of figure out what we have there. And I think that's a pretty good balance. Now, sometimes you can find that you're getting kind of like tears here. And first of all, sometimes the bump node can do that and you can kind of put the same value of the displacement into the bump node. I just hit control C and control V to copy it over there. And that seems to have kind of affected or fixed all the affected areas that were black. So if your bump node strength is too high or if your displacement node is too high, it can actually start to kind of chair that geometry and screw it up. So again, you can kind of continue to play with all these settings if you want. I'm gonna turn my specular down to 0.1 because I wanna kind of keep things looking a little bit darker. And again, if this is too extreme, you can go ahead and play with those settings. But let's look about how we can kind of group this up into an easy to adjust setting. So we will grab these, move these down. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a hue and saturation so we can kind of control the color of our wood. So let's create that and with Node Wrangler, you can just drag that on top and move that there. So now what we wanna do is group this all into one node. So what we can do is grab these, select all those, hit Control G, and that's going to send us into a node group. Now, if we hold Tab, we can go in and out of that. And we come out here, you can see that now our node is just here and you can rename that node group if you want by tapping it and pressing F2. So let's call this wood. And now we have a wood node group. And if we come over here and we do our surface, you can see that now it's condensed all that down there. We don't have all those node controls. So what we can do is tab back into the wood node and we can kind of decide which things we want to expose. So here we have the output, which it's done for us automatically is we want a BDSF output and a displacement output, which we can feed into a material input. But we want a couple more input controls. So here we have this kind of input shader here. And what we can do here is we can grab this and we can pump this into hue. And then we'll grab this little dot down here and pump this into saturation, grab this one here and pump this into value. And you can go ahead and plug this into whatever you want. So let's say that we want to be able to control our displacement scale. You can put that there and let's say that we want to do our height strength. So now we can kind of control the height strength and the scale from out here. And you can see here that we can control our hue and saturation. So let's say that we wanted to create a darker wood and we put a 0.5 and a 0.75 of desaturation. We kind of create a darker kind of gray wood there. You can play at those values until you get some looks that you like. And if you want, you can actually get rid of this value here you can put it into there. And this second scale here, you can then kind of control all of that. Now, personally, I just prefer to kind of come into the node group and use a value node because I find that to be a bit easier. But with this, if we tap out of here, you can see that now we have all of our controls here and we're able to kind of work with that wood texture there. And with that, you have a stylized wood texture node that you can go through and adjust to your heart's content until you get a look that you like. So let's go through some tips on how to kind of use this realistically in your scenes. So first of all, pay attention to UV direction. You can rotate and scale your UVs to adjust the size and direction of your wood grain. And you can also add edge wear by texture painting your object and then using that image on your materials. I used a white to paint an edge wear and then I plugged that map into a mix shader with two wood notes plugged in. On one, I use the default settings, and then for worn wood edges, I like to go with a slightly more yellow color with a higher value and a lower saturation. That kind of makes the wood look like it's seen some age and years. Let's talk about that tablet a bit. This is the Artisol D16 Pro. It's a 16 inch display tablet, and it's got these nice buttons over here and a little scroll wheel, which if you were paying attention in the time lapse, you'll see that I use them quite a bit. It comes with a paper texture screen protector, a nice stand, and the screen is pretty crisp. I don't do heavy painting every day, but with my use of it so far, I've been really pleased. The screen is nice and the pressure sensitivity works well, and I'll share my thoughts of it long-term as the channel goes on, but my initial impressions are good. They have a smaller and cheaper options as well, 
well, so you can check out their website now while they have a big Mother's Day sale going on if you're interested. There's a link in the description below and there's more details there if you'd like to learn more. And as usual, thanks again for watching my tutorial. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And I always love when you share your results on Instagram. So tag me and I try and share them to my stories every time I see them. Again, thanks for watching and let me know what you'd like to see next.